He's right, he doesn't know me at all. This is a high risk experiment that we're doing this morning. Um, Michael did ask me to speak about my passion for the next generation, so that should take roughly about three hours, give or take. Lunch will be served at intermission. Um, no, I'm just kidding, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we got a lot of ground to cover. Um, I, like he said, I work for Raise Up Faith. I get to serve as the chief mission officer with this international organization. The head office is actually in the UK, which is fun for me. Uh, and I get to travel all around uh, talking about Jesus and how to talk about Jesus with this generation. Now, we talk about next generation for a few well, difficult reasons. We talk about the church of the future being kids. I'm here to tell you they aren't the future, they're here. And they're capable. And they are looking at the world all the time differently than you or I did. I can say that because they're not here, they're in Discovery Park. They have uh, devices in their hands that give them access to what's happening in Israel and Gaza in real time. Think about how that would have shaped you as a six-year-old. What I want you to know is that tech isn't the problem. I kind of have to say that because I work for a tech company. Raise Up Faith is actually a platform that hosts over 18,000 digital assets from videos to lessons to Bible stories to worship songs to crafts to games. It's pretty much the Pinterest of kids ministry, if you will. And the whole reason why we've done that is because we want to help kids learn about Jesus, come into a loving relationship with him in a way that they are already learning. Tech isn't the problem. The problem is that we're not going with them. We're asking them to do differently to make us comfortable. Well, since when in scripture has doing what Jesus did looked comfortable? There isn't really very much comfortable about following Jesus. In fact, my experience of being called into ministry was something like getting my chair upturned into the aisle and having my butt kicked down to the front until I did as he asked me to. That might just be my experience. Some of us more stubborn people need a swift kick. But I've called uh, the talk this morning unprecedented, uh, unprecedented times, air quotes included, because I hear this phrase a lot in the work I do as I look to follow the mission, not just of Jesus, but also the mission of Raise Up Faith to inspire and equip generations to live Jesus-centered, joy-filled lives. Joy seems to be in short supply. Joy seems to be something we have supplanted with happiness. They're not the same thing. And so we want to inspire people to live Jesus-centered, joy-filled lives in these unprecedented times. But in the research and the work that I do, I have to tell you that if we go back to the very dawn of humanity, I'm not sure we can be so arrogant to call these unprecedented times. We have a giant book, a thick scriptural text that is a story of God telling us who he is and God telling us who we are over thousands of years. And guess what happens over and over? They listen, they forget, they disobey. They listen, they forget, they disobey. And it may be that we find ourselves in the middle of forgetfulness or this is hard. This is unprecedented. Yesterday I referred to before 2020 as the before times, you know, when things were easier. It's like we forget that not much has actually changed except we were changed by a traumatic experience. Imagine parenting a child while working full time and not being able to lose, leave your house during COVID. That wasn't everybody's experience, but that was some people in this room's experienced, experience. Some children have missed developmental milestones, and yet they have re-entered a school system that hasn't made accommodations for the fact that somehow they were supposed to learn to read on their own. So while COVID was seemingly unprecedented, it wasn't, there have been pandemics before, it seemed unprecedented, it was just new to you. And so we can go back to scripture and look for examples of how God's family has done this over and over and over. His word is enough. 
The word of God is sufficient to lead us through any time that we don't understand. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean we're doing it wrong. It might mean you just have some learning to do in order to serve the generation that is coming up right now. Now we say that the kids that have left us, they've gone somewhere else, they are the future leaders of the church. Maybe, I bet if you asked Hannah though, some of them are leaders today. What gifts of the Holy Spirit are they already walking in that we could invite them to serve in today? How do we get to know what the future church looks like if we aren't engaged with them in real time? What are we missing out on? I want to start by looking at Ezra. Ezra is my favorite book for all kinds of reasons we don't have time to go into. It's a weird book to love the most, but I really do. Ezra 3, and it, it might be a little bit difficult to read, so I'll just read it out for you. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. I love that Israel always landed in this place when they wanted to sing to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endure, endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But... Mm. Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud as they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound between the shouts of joy and the sounds of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. That's happening in today's churches. There are people coming in here, learning about Jesus for the first time and giving great shouts of joy, while we have other groups of people lamenting the way it used to be. It's not supposed to be this way. I'm glad I don't have to parent in this day and age. It's the mixing and mingling of these two things. Now, what was also happening at this time is it's the re-foundation, the new foundation of the old temple that fell during exile, they've come home to rebuild the temple. And why were they weeping? Well, the thing was, those who remembered the first temple remembered what it was like. And they had expectations that God would do something, but God didn't do the same thing twice. And so they were upset and weeping because God wasn't who they thought he should be and he didn't show up the way he, they thought he should be. At the first foundation, God showed up in fire and smoke and they knew that his presence had filled it. This time, the foundation is laid nothing. They drew all kinds of conclusions about who God is and where he isn't based on the fact that God had a different plan this time. Sometimes we just have to leave room for God to do different because it's a different group of people this time. This moment in Ezra was a it's not supposed to be this way moment for God's people. For some of us, this moment in the history of the church is a, it's not supposed to be this way moment. We understand the grief. We have memories of the way it used to be, and we don't quite see what God is up to yet. Later, in Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Ezra used to be one book. Nehemiah was the third to come along and finish off. He was the one, you know, build the wall, cup bear. I'm going to go build a wall. The king says, cool. He comes over, builds a wall. Ezra's still around. They are friends. They're doing this together. Ezra is the priest. They build a platform, probably not unlike this one. They, he climbs up onto it. Why? So that everybody could see him. It's very practical. He gets up onto this platform, opens the book of the law, and what happens? They all fall on their faces in worship. Why? Because when they began to rebuild the foundation, they were scraping back the rubble, all these rocks, this pile of destruction, and what did they found, find? The thing that some of them didn't even know existed. They found the book of the law. Some of the weeping and wailing is because they had forgotten. They had it. They had the word of God. Where was it? We found it. They were all exiled and didn't know who had it. It's kind of like those old photos where my mom's still trying to figure out which sibling or aunt and uncle ended up with that photo album. It's this 
family inheritance, his book of the law, they uncover it and here it is. Well, the ones who were there when they were giving shouts of joy while the others were weeping and wailing, by this point they know what it is. And their only response collectively was to fall down and worship. And as they celebrated and gave these shouts of joy and wept and wailed, Ezra said, no more, we're just going to celebrate. And I wonder if we can learn something from that moment. Even though you don't understand this generation, maybe, even though it seems so impossible to parent in this day and age, even though you don't get it, the way things are happening, could we celebrate that he is good, God's faithful love endures forever? And you have children in this building who believe that with their whole hearts. So take a breath. You've adjusted to me now. I tried to, you know, give you a precursor by the outfit and thought maybe you'd catch up by the time I, you know, did that part. So just take a breath. We're all comfortable now. Maybe. But I want to leave you with these two questions just before I pray and head into some of the meat. That wasn't the meat. When you think about engaging the next generation, what for the cause of Christ, whether it's on Tuesday nights or Sunday mornings, whether they're your grandkids or your own kids or your neighbors, maybe they're the kids you haven't had yet that you're praying for, what are your shouts of joy and cries of sorrow for this generation? What real questions and challenges around discipleship of families, kids, and youth is the church facing? Now, I put a small C there there because you are a church, and you can answer that question just for Emmanuel. But there's a big C church question in that too. Let's pray, and then we'll move in. Father, I thank you for this family. I thank you for the invitation, the bold invitation to just have me come and share my heart. Would you open my mouth wide, Lord, and fill it with good things according to Psalm 81? Would it land on ears that find great delight in the sound of your word? And if anything I say is not for these people, would you cause a divine forgetfulness for the things that weren't meant for this moment? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. So let's look at some of the unprecedented things that you all are facing with today's generation. Now, if I told you that 47% of zero to four-year-olds in North America already own smart devices, that's unprecedented. That's unprecedented. So I'm going to give you an example of what happens when we engage with children intergenerationally with a device. Now think about it. Gen Alpha is today's kids. They are the children of millennials. Millennials are digital natives. So millennials have never known an age without the internet. Their children are the first generation of parents to never have a digital era. So this is now multi-generation digital natives. If you just put up the next slide, I'm going to give you a moment doesn't matter what the body paragraph was, a 76-year-old grandfather wrote a text to his grandson, Sandy. Sandy's a normal name in Scotland for a boy. He writes it like a letter, as if Sandy doesn't know that the text is for him, right? Only Sandy gets texts on Sandy's phone. But I digress. We address it, dear Sandy, because that's how you start a letter. We write paragraphs with proper punctuation, I might add. And we sign it, LOL, WTF. (laughs) This happens a number of times before Sweet Sandy calls his dear auntie, who he's close, close with, and says, Auntie, something's wrong with Grandpa. I don't know why he's so angry. But I can't tell if he's angry because he seems to be laughing a lot. And she says, Sandy, what are you talking about? And he says, I'm going to send you a screenshot of a text from Grandpa. And this is what she gets. Horrified, Auntie calls her dad. Says, Dad, what have you been texting to Sandy? Oh, I just text him every once in a while, ask him about rugby, ask him about his school day, ask him about how things are going. She said, how do you sign 
you're, first of all, why do you sign your text? We know who it's for. Like, you don't have to sign a text any more than you have to address a text, but how do you sign them? Well, I sign them LOL, WTF. And she says, what do you think you're saying? He says, lots of love, William Todd Ferguson. <laughs> because why wouldn't you sign a text to your grandson with your monogram? Some of you still don't get the joke, and some of you don't even think this is real. This is real. This really happened. Also, if you use a period at the end of a sentence, you're mad. Proper punctuation is not welcome at the end of a text anymore. Each sentence is its own text. That's how you punctuate. Let me help you a little further. The next slide, for that you won't know this, but the one where you think someone must have died because you're sobbing very hard, that actually is just the emoji for laughing now. The other one is the one old people use according to Gen Z. The next one, if you're, really, like if you're dying laughing, you're actually using the skull. The other one, well, now you're just like, you're definitely a mom. <laughs> also, if you ever use the thumbs up emoji, you're only a dad. Only dads use thumbs up. There is no way of knowing this. This is not known. This is secret code among teenagers to make grown-ups feel stupid. That's what I've decided. I have three of them in my house, and I'm never right with my emojis. The last one, just to clarify, on this skull, the one on the left still means laughing. The other one means actually dead, and so you would never use it because you wouldn't be texting if you're dead. <laughs> Duh. Word to the wise, we live in an area that is very rich with peaches. Fruits and vegetables are off limits in the emoji world. Do not use them. They're not safe. I started doing this research about what does the future church look like. Now, when I say future church, I don't mean children. I mean actually what the the shape, the look, the ministry of the future church looks like. I started doing it, this research in 2019. The last time I looked at the research and presented the research was uh, March 8th of 2020. It's also the last time I traveled for a little while. But at that point, the statistic was for Canada that 60% of our pastors were facing retirement in the next 10 years. And there wasn't enough seminary enrollment for a one-to-one -one replacement. The, to be clear, replacing a pastor is not ideal. You do want options. You do, you know, like, it's like when you find out that 60% is a pass in medical school. You're like, do I want that doctor? Do I want any pastor? Or do, or do I want the person who's called to serve this community? The, the number of young adults in seminary was less than the number of pastors that would be retiring over the next 10 years, and the trajectory was grim. In fact, today, even in the US, seminary enrollment continues to decline by about 30% each year. Beyond that, we had a pandemic. I don't know if you noticed. I don't know if it, if, did, did you have it here? Florida didn't have it, apparently, but we definitely had it in Ontario. The thing about the pandemic was that we then saw in 2021 something that's been dubbed the Great Resignation. And according to the Deloitte Economic Study, the Global Economic Study of Millennials and Gen Z, Gen Z is already, if you still think millennials are living in their parents' basements, you've missed a beat. They now have children and they're like 40, so we can move on from that. Gen Z is now in the workplace. The oldest end of Gen Z is in the workplace. And Deloitte, their global economic study, would have you know the great resignation will be with us for a while. So that stat of 60% over the next 10 years retiring is now at the point that for every seven pastors that retire in Canada, there is only one seminary enrollment. And out of all seminary grads, because we know enrollment doesn't mean graduation, for every seminary grad, only 20% go into full-time ministry. We have a problem. Somehow, this job 
has not been made attractive. Somehow leading a church does not look like the future this generation would like to invest in. They're coming, but they just don't want to lead this. This looks hard. This looks disingenuous. It look, we have a problem with authenticity. We have a generation of change makers, Gen Alpha, coming up, nipping at the heels of Gen Z, and they want to see real change in the world, and they're not sure you're ready for it. They're not sure you really want to hear what they have to say. And you want to know what? They're saying it anyway. They're saying it on social media. They're saying it on school. They're saying it wherever they get a microphone because there are things that they are not okay with. And I'm not sure they're wrong about some of the things that need to change. So how do people come to faith and how do we change this for the sake of the church? There's a study coming out of the UK called Talking Jesus. It came out just in this, uh, less than a year ago, last November. Uh, and it, this is what they found out. <laughs> I mean, we shouldn't be surprised, but here we are. Growing up in a Christian family, that's 34% of Christians. Now, as you heard, youth on Tuesday nights, about half of them aren't growing up in a Christian family. So that's already a difficult statistic. It doesn't say how many people are growing up in a Christian family. It just says that it's the most likely way for someone to have the faith passed on. Reading the Bible. Imagine. I think we get nervous about scripture being weird. Like it's, they're just weird, harsh stories and we want people to know how, how much God loves them. And so we shy away from actually sharing the word of God with people. It's the number two reason people come to faith. Because it's living and active. Attending a physical church service other than a, a wedding or funeral. I think that's an important caveat. So actually coming to church, that's reason number three. Sunday school, Discovery Park, that's up there. A spiritual experience. Now, when I say that, it might not look like what you think it looks like, or it might not be like how you have a spiritual experience. I had one little boy describe it as the Holy Spirit whooshing into the room. I think we should make more room for whooshing. I think kids know when the Holy Spirit is present and they don't have language for it. And so when we talk about it, it actually makes them feel less weird and makes God seem really amazing. Conversations with Christians you know well. That means kids need to know you. In fact, for a child to stay in the faith through university and into adulthood, they need five to seven adults beyond their parents who agree about who Jesus is. That's you. There might be a particular event, whether positive or negative, so sometimes trauma brings people to the end of themselves and the need for a savior. Sometimes magnificent things that could only be explained by a miracle will also bring people to Jesus. And then responding to the gospel at a Christian event or service, that's the lowest, right? Those, those moments, it's less likely in a moment to happen. What this points to is relationship. Discipleship happens on top of relationship. The gospel happens on top of relationship. It is the way of Jesus. So the other thing that came out of this study that I found interesting was, um, well, confirming more than anything, is the age at which practicing Christians come to faith. If you look at the next graph and add up the 0 to 18 category, it's about 84% of people come to faith before the age of 18. 84%. Now, how many of you came to a relationship, knowledge of Jesus, or some sort of interaction spiritually with God before the age of 18? Yeah. That number actually hasn't changed over time. And if you read your Bible and see the way Jesus talks about kids, that checks out. That makes a lot of sense. Here's why kids come to Jesus, why 84% of children are making spiritual decisions. By the age of five, a child has determined who or what God is. Five, one handful of years old, they have determined who God is, whether he's angry or loving, or if there even is a God. They may never have even heard of God by five, and if that's true, now they don't believe in God. Five, between 5 and 12, they decide whether they agree with what they knew by the time they were 5. These, I mean, we make sound decisions between 5 and 12. This, is, this just makes lots of sense that we're making these kinds of... But 
God designed children to hear from him. And so in that time of deciding, the Holy Spirit is actively in communication with children, helping to reconcile what they knew by five. It's not just us. It's the Holy Spirit in us, talking to the Holy Spirit in that child to make a decision to follow Jesus based on what they know about a loving, good God. Now, by 13, this number has come down significantly by about, well, let's say by three years, in the last two years since COVID, a person's worldview. It used to be shaped by the age of 16. It's now shaped and sticky by 13. So you think about watching what's happening in the world today and making a decision, having a worldview by 13 years old today. Between 12 and 17, and if you've met a teenager, this makes a lot of sense, they are defending what they've decided. I was actually kicked out of the church at 15, so I went on a deep dive and read the New Testament back to back several times the three months after I was kicked out of the church to decide whether I agreed with the church or agreed with Jesus. I'm here. The Bible's good. God is good. He was faithful in that time. But I took a world religions course the next year, and and, and we weren't allowed to study our own religion, and I went to the teacher and I said, I'm not sure. This this is a make-or-break project for me. I want to do Christianity, and I want to decide, and I want to defend what I believe in. I'm here. God's word is true. God does not disagree with himself, neither about who he is nor about who you are. He is in agreement with himself about who you are. You are his child. You are good. You were made to do good. You were made with a plan and a purpose. You were made to be filled up with his spirit to speak and teach and show love to the world around you so that Jesus would be made known, so that he can come again and his kingdom will take over and he will reign. That's that's who you are. Welcome. For our teenagers that are coming on Tuesday night to be in that stage of defending what they've decided, let's give them something to stand firm on. Let's give them the solid foundation. Let's not make them dig through the rubble for the book of the law. Let's not make them 40 years old and weeping and wailing wailing, because how come nobody told me? I was in a church every Tuesday. How, How did I not know? This is a beautiful time in a person's life to tell them who they are and whose they are. Here's the good news about what non-Christians are asking that I think is really worth paying attention to. Is there a purpose to life? What will make me happy? What should I do with my life? Will everything be okay? What happens when you die? Is there a God? Notice how low that is. That's because adults were surveyed and that decision was made by the time they were five. They're not asking. What's really interesting is that's the same question a lot of parents inside the church are asking. What's even more interesting is it's the same question most of their kids and youth are asking. The problem is they're asking each other on TikTok. They're following people on TikTok that seem to resonate with what they feel. And they aren't asking you. And I want them to ask you. I see discipleship a lot like, um, well, if we were elephants, it would look something like this. Jungle Book, usually the, the animated version of Jungle Book lines them up from biggest to smallest. And it's really cute. You've got this long train of elephants. And they go trunk to tail, trunk to tail, trunk to tail. That's actually not the way elephants travel. The matriarch goes at the front. She knows the way. She's been trained by someone previously. Her predecessor takes the rear of the caboose because she also knows the way but also goes slow enough that if someone is lagging, she will notice. And in between, the elders who know the way flank the kids. The kids go in between and they are protected. It doesn't look like this. Big elephants in one room, small elephants in another room, one train of all the tallest elephants, one train of the smallest elephants. They don't, that's not safe. It's dangerous, in fact. That puts 
the babies at risk. And I think sometimes we forget that those baby elephants have as much to learn from the mamas that are around them as the mamas have to learn from each other's babies. There are things about today's generation that they would love to tell you about. So I wonder if you're asking. Do you know what their hearts are breaking for? Do you know what change they want to see in the world, let alone be in the world? Do you know what they're facing at school? That child that used to be super outgoing and bubbly and skip through the halls, who seems quite reserved, withdrawn, does, has someone asked why? There's a moment right before Moses hands off leadership of Israel to Joshua, and he says this, in Deuteronomy. Love God, your God, this is very familiar, with your whole heart. Love him with all that's in you. Love him with all you've got. This is the Eugene Peterson message version. Write these commands that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside you and then get them inside your children. I've been on 28 airplanes in the last year. I call this the oxygen mask principle. Put yours on first. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up until in the morning until you fall into bed at night. If you've parented, falling into bed at night is what you do. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your homes and on your city gates. Here's a mistake I used to make that I think we make. We speak this passage over parents as if it's their responsibility single-handedly. Moses spoke it over all 12 tribes, all members of all 12 tribes, all together. This is our responsibility. It's not mom and dad's responsibility. It's not grandma and grandpa's responsibility. It is our collective responsibility as the family of God. Here's how I know we have a problem there. 91% of children's ministry leaders, according to Barna, think it's the parent's job to bring their children to Christ. 91% of kids' pastors think it's the parents' job. 56% of parents think it's the kids' pastor's job. Can you imagine what would happen if they started to agree that it's our job? And if you began to come alongside them and say, what do you need? How can I be one of the five to seven adults in your kid's life? Here's the good news about how non-Christians People who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus describe Christians. Everybody's like cringing at the moment. It's good. I know that because I know what it says about what non-Christians think about the church, and it looks very different. We're talking about just people right now. The non-Christians describe Christians they know as caring, friendly, encouraging, hopeful, good-humored, generous, authentic. There is hope. We as Christians tend to shy away. We don't want to offend. We don't want to be too, you know, in your face with anything. This is how they see you. Why not? They think you're delightful. You have no reason to not engage in a conversation about Jesus with a non-Christian. You're good humored. This graph matters because you are unlikely to offend someone by telling them you are a Christian. That is not an offensive thing to be. Where your courage comes from, well, that's the Lord. But actually talking about Jesus matters, and you have the privilege of doing so. No one's worried about you talking about Jesus. Here's the other good news. One in three non-Christians, after talking to a Christian, want to know more about Jesus. Please tell me that doesn't surprise you. If you heard about Jesus Christ and how incredible he is, how loving he is, how generous he was, how kind he was, how he went through Samaria instead of around it, he went after the ones who were hurting people, he took in the lost, the broken, the rejected, the trafficked, and he sat with them and said, I love you. I'd want to know more about someone who can do that. You don't have to be afraid about talking about the greatest man to ever live. The son of the living God. You do not have to worry about that conversation. It is a really, really good story. 
Our parenting group today of little kids, millennials and older Gen Z, they are a passionate people. They are passionate about parents, par about their kids, about parenting. They don't necessarily feel equipped to disciple their kids alone, and I don't think they should have to. There was a book that came out not long ago. Oh, well, let's be honest, 10, 15 years ago. It's not that old. But Hemorrhaging Faith. Some of you will have read the book called Hemorrhaging Faith. And it was basically a book that studied where did all the millennials go? They're not in the churches. And millennials got a bad rap for a good long time. Let me tell you, they are the economic driving generation globally. They're also the most educated generation in history. We like them. They're smart and they're moving the economy. These are good people to have, good people to know, and they are today's parents. One particular Christian uh, that did her PhD at Biola was a little annoyed by hemorrhaging faith because she was like, but I stayed. So why did people stay? So she did her PhD on why people stayed. And there are seven major themes that emerged. Personal engagement in Christianity, loving actions from Christians, uh, negative experiences uh, contributed to doubling down on Christianity, like trauma, death, um, mental health, different things that happened. Uh, commitment was perceived as positive. So their church environment saw commitment as a positive thing, and so they would make more of a commitment. Close relationships with committed Christians, there's that word relationship again. Attending church was perceived as positive. That starts at home when you're willing to get up and get everybody into the minivan, but it also starts by having somewhere that people want to show up to. And family engaged in Christ Christian activities together. That could just be having dinner, talking about how was your day, what can I pray for, all of these activities that look like family experiences by God's definition of coming together in relationship. These are what contribute to um, a long-lasting relationship beyond university for kids growing up in the church. So think about what you're currently doing as a church, as a small group, as a community, as a follower of Jesus. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir after all that I heard this morning. So I know you're with me in this. But in order to get Deuteronomy 6 right, we have to do this together as a community. It is not the parent's fault and it is not their single responsibility. When we look at Jesus saying, let them come, it is better to tie a giant rock around your neck and throw yourself into the sea than to cause a little one to stumble. That seems pretty significant. It's kind of a big deal. And he wasn't saying that to parents. He was saying that to us, to the whole community. So I'm afraid to tell you the only bad news is that if you remember this next image of church, I certainly do, it may never look quite like that again. And that's okay. What I also want to tell you if you loved that era of church is that there was nothing wrong with it. We didn't change it because it was bad. We didn't change it because it wasn't doing its job. It served you, and so we'll do different to serve them. The, the Word of God is living and active. The people of God are living and active. This really matters that we go with kids at the pace that they learn today. This wasn't the problem, but it might not be the solution today. I want to leave you with 1 Peter, and this picture of rocks is just, you know, a prettier arrangement of pebbles and not quite the rubble of Ezra 3. But when we think about these stones that we build this foundation of faith on, I'm reminded of what Joshua did right after Moses spoke, after he gave that great command in Deuteronomy to the whole family of God and then said, peace out, I'm staying on this side. Joshua gets them across the river, the river parts. They're standing with the Ark of the Covenant in the middle and Joshua goes, wait a second, go back to the center of the river. One priest from every tribe, one dude, go back, get a rock out of the riverbed and bring it back. Joshua then commands each of these men of the tribes to build a monument with these rocks as a place to return to in order to remember. What has God done? In scriptural days, it was called an Ebenezer. We build these Ebenezers. 
My encouragement to you is to build Ebenezer's that you can return to with children so that you don't find yourself weeping and wailing over what we forgot, but celebrating what God did then and what God continues to do now. And just like Paul said in Ephesians, Peter then says in 1 Peter 2, Christ is the living stone. People did not accept him, but God chose him. God places the highest value on him. You are also like living stones. As you come to Christ, you are being built into a house of worship. We don't need that foundation of the old temple anymore. Why? Because you're it. You've been tagged in. The building doesn't matter. You do. When you come together in holy communion, you are the temple. This is the temple. Your body, together, you are the living stone stacked up, built into a house of worship. There, you will be holy priests. You will offer spiritual sacrifices. God will accept them because of what Christ Jesus has done. In scripture, it says, look, I am placing a stone in Zion. It is chosen and very valuable. It is the most important stone in the building. The one who trusts him will never be put to shame. This stone is very valuable to you who believe. But to people who do not believe, the stone the builders did not accept has become the most important stone of all. But God chose you to be his people You are his royal priests. You are a holy nation. You are God's special treasure. You are all these things so that you can give him praise. God brought you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You have one job for this next generation. Give him praise. Talk about him from the time you get up until you fall into bed at night. Write it on your wrists. Inscribe it on your doorposts. Praise our God, to him be the glory, for great things he has done, let us not forget. These are not unprecedented times, but we don't have to stop remembering. 